All right, thank you, thank you. All right, appreciate the applause, but I know you're not here to see me. First, I want to say to the, uh, to the members, thank you for coming back. Thank you for your support, getting us through COVID and getting us to this point. I know we have a lot of non-members here. Thank you for the support that you give. I would like to turn you into members because your donations and your membership supports our mission of educate, commemorate, and serve. And your donations allow us to do things to events like tonight. And uh, it's absolutely incredible the, uh, what General Petraeus brings to us. And, and uh, let me just say real quick, General Petraeus, you honor us with your presence. Thank you. When you think you're busy, spend a little time with General Petraeus and think about his schedule and it doesn't even compare. So for him to take the time out coming back from back east to be out here for our members and our membership, it's absolutely incredible. So again, a, Thank you very much. You want to respond to the present. Thank you. And uh, what I'd like to do is turn it over now to our Emmy Award winning moderator. You all know him as Mike Saray, our board member here at the Marines Memorial. And again, thank you very much for your support. Mike, over to you. Thank you, General Rocco. <laughs> and thanks to all of you who have been waiting since March. 2022 for this that we were scheduled to do this earlier my apologies but you general, know general I stood you all up emergency there was one and so but uh, but he was gracious enough to say i'll be back and he's back and we're glad to have you with us tonight it's a privilege to be here uh I, you know it's been a long time since the last one uh, i was still in uniform it was u.s central command days between iraq and afghanistan um, very memorable occasion and it really is a thrill to be back. And thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks for your support of this great institution, uh, especially after it's weathered the whole challenges of COVID as every hotel and establishment like it did. Thanks uh, to Mike Rocco there, over there. You know, you're very, very fortunate to have him as your CEO, a battlefield hero. You know, the Marines aren't, aren't big on giving officers medals. Uh, so to have someone who earns a distinguished flying cross with V and an air medal with V and a bunch of other air medals and a bunch of other ribbons is really quite extraordinary. He was a tremendous attack helicopter pilot and then later commander of a Marine Air Wing and so forth. And Mike, we remain grateful to you, especially for what you did for the Marines and some soldiers on the ground. Thank you. So, so, General, for uh, this being our leading from the front series, a form on leadership. That's the best way to lead. It's, it, it's hard to lead from the rear of the formation. Exactly. <laughs> and it, in all sectors of American life. And so for this series, we're very serious about it. So in addition to our senior military brain trust for coming up with names and recommendations, we also vet our potential interviewees on uh, Google AI Bard to see Excellent. if we got Good. the right person. And okay. I thought you might be curious to know what happens if you put in, is General Petraeus a great American leader? And according to Google, AI Bard says, uh, Petraeus is a controversial figure, but there is no doubt that he is a great American leader. He is a skilled military commander, a strategic thinker, and a strong advocate for civilian military cooperation. He has made significant contributions to the US military and the national security of the United States. So is well, that good enough for you on that, AI? That, that's, no, that's very, very kind. Um, you know, they left off the part about that I was a military celebrity, or celebrity general, they called it. That was not a term of endearment. And <laughs> that, that, at least under the second president, I was privileged to serve as a combat commander. The first one was fine with it. Well, I had the honor, if not the pleasure, to see General Petraeus in action at work in the field in difficult situations. 19 years ago, Mosul, Iraq, he steps into probably the mother of all leadership crises, which is the co country was coming apart, the insurgency was starting, the economy was on its knees, and he had to stand up a police force because the last one got fired. So you walk into that. You don't learn that. Do you learn that at West Point? Do you learn that at Fort Bragg or Fort Benning? Where do you learn the skills to take on such diverse challenges like that? You read the Marine Corps Small Wars Manual, actually, um, <laughs> in all honesty. So I had actually had this sort of lifelong fascination with what we would call counterinsurgency, uh, irregular warfare. And the only manual that was actually around when we were into these wars in the early years was the Marine Corps uh, Small Wars Manual. And I read it assiduously. Of course, we then produced, uh, actually, Jim Madison and I did it together. 
uh, the, the Army and Marine Corps counterinsurgency field manual when I was between my three and four star tours in Iraq. That was the two star tour you're talking about. But I had served uh, really just a summer in uh, Central America where we had, and uh, Latin America where we had counterinsurgency operations going on in El Salvador, Colombia, Peru, and then we were fostering an insurgency uh, again with the Sandinistas, as you may recall, against Nicaragua. Uh, that was the other side of the airfield. That was the black side. We were generally on the white side. That was my future f firm or f future endeavor uh, of the CIA. Uh, and then I did Haiti. Uh, I was actually a United Nations officer in Haiti. I was not dual-headed as you normally are. I was the United Nations Chief of Operations. Uh, and then did Bosnia for a year, which interestingly, although it was seen as a peacekeeping operation, there I was dual-headed. I was also the deputy, I was a one-star. I was the Chief of Operations again for the, the uh, NATO mission. But I was the deputy commander of a clandestine joint task force that was doing the war criminal hunt. And Rumsfeld turned us loose that year. We got more war criminals in one year. But all those diverse but assignments. All of this, all of this builds it. And I'd written my dissertation at Princeton uh, on uh, the U.S. military and the lessons of Vietnam. Uh, so there was this fascination. I'd read deeply about the French in Andochine, Indochina. Uh, us in Vietnam, uh, where, by the way, again, the only force that really got that right, I've just finished a book, by the way, with a great British historian, uh, Andrew Roberts, now Baron Roberts of Belgravia. Uh, he's got to make money to pay for that townhouse in Belgravia. <laughs> a nice so he, he, ca yeah. came to, he came to me <laughs> with this book idea. And I did, uh, I, I, we took turns doing chapters. I did Vietnam and then also, obviously, Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot on Ukraine. Uh, but when I went back to Vietnam, you know, the CAP program, which the Marines did, uh, largely without support of Westmoreland, who wanted to fight the big war, um, was the only really successful example in that country of what we should have been doing, which was to carry out a civil, comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign instead of chasing all around the country uh, with m large units that were often causing as much damage as they did good. Uh, it was a, we made huge mistakes there. So again, I was a student of this. Um, and again, Mattis and I got together and we decided not to make this manual a joint manual because then I'd lose control of it. We wanted to do just Army and Marine Corps. No one has ever done a manual in less than a year from start to finish. But I had the unqualified backing of the Chief of Staff of the Army. He had the backing of the Commandant. Uh, I remember the chief, when I went to see him, I came home from the three-star tour in Iraq, went out to Fort Leavenworth, which is sort of like your Quantico, but you got all sorts of different hats. Uh, and I said, Chief, you got any guidance for me? He said, yeah, shake up the army, Dave. He <laughs> said, I, I can do that, Chief, as long as you have my back. And he did. Uh, so again, and then we got to execute it, actually, in the surge in Iraq with a president that went literally all in. But when you look at those military. challenges as a leader, you think a military leader, yes, there's some obvious challenges and probably some obvious skill sets that you rely on. But when you get thrown into a civilian situation like this, yep. where there's chaos in the streets, yep. there is no governance, no one really has a plan, yep. what do you fall back on as a leader? What, what assets do you try to bring to bear there? And thankfully, there's no guidance from Baghdad, so we right. could do whatever we wanted to do. Yep. Uh, this is in Mosul, again, in Nainoa province, historic Nineveh. Um, a lot of the old Assyrian Christian and so forth. Um, look, what we fell back on was, in, in many respects, this lifetime of study, but in particular, the campaign plan that we had in Bosnia, of all things, was really a great model of you know, different lines of operation. The problem was that in Bosnia, you had the European Union high rep did the politics. You had the United Nations mission that did the police training. You had another group, Issy Tapper, was one of those that did uh, OSCE that did the rule of law. You had another international organization that did, you had MPRI that did the training of the security forces. We didn't have any of that in Mosul, but that's okay. Uh, we, we figured out how to do it. I basically assigned every single ministry activity uh, in Nainoa province, I assigned a unit to it. Some of these were easy. Um, you know, we took the military police battalion, we put them, let's rebuild the police academy, as you said, let's start training the police. Uh, took an air defense battalion. We weren't tr doing any air defense at that point. Made them in charge of training other security forces. The medical battalion uh, fixed the hospital. 
The problem was we didn't have anybody that knew anything about universities. So we had a spare aviation. We had two aviation brigades. We had, this is the biggest aviation fleet of any division in the world, um, even bigger than I think what mo one MEF might bring to bear, but don't tell the guys down in San Diego, please. Um, and so uh, one of those, I said, you take on the university. This is 30,000 students, you know, 21 colleges and so forth. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, American Ingenuity, in their ranks, they found all this talent and they applied it in here, there, and everywhere else. Plus, we have lawyers and contractors, contracting officers and Class A agents who can hold money. You can fix anything with that. And we did. So basically, everyone was responsible. I had a responsibility. My responsibility was the governor. We were talking earlier, as you'll recall, how we, we were the first uh, province in Iraq to have a, an interim provincial council. The big idea there, you know, it's all about getting the big ideas right. I mean, we have in this room a lot of leaders. Uh, and you know that in strategic leaders in particular, you have to perform four tasks. You've got to get the big ideas right. You have to communicate them effectively through the breadth and depth of the organization to all other stakeholders. You have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. That's what we normally think of as leadership. That's the example, the energy, the inspiration, the incentivization, the metrics, the how you spend your time, your battle rhythm, it's hiring, it's firing, it's developing, it's all of that. And then a fourth task that's often overlooked, uh, that's to, and you have to formally do it, which is to sit down and determine how to refine the big ideas to do it again and again and again. You just keep doing that. Remember Kodak, 2,000 patents on digital photography. They were the best film photography and associated services in the world. 2,000 patents on digital photography, they failed to make that the new big idea early enough, and they've never been the same. So again, you think about this, so we had big ideas for everything. I well, said, okay, I want a provincial council that is representative of all the elements of Nainua province, and we want to have majority rule, but minority rights. And we set about that, and by golly, that's, that worked. And now, you know, I, I, I made I, sure we got the governor that we wanted, of course. You were also out of money, and so the big idea, and I got to witness We started making money. You had to start making So we I did, got, believe I got awakened by one of your aides, so we're going mm -hmm. on a raid, and I thought it was to go get some munitions or whatever, and it ends up we're going to try to find money that was stashed away by... Yep. And because you needed the money to yeah. jumpstart the economy. Yeah, you know, we had pretty good intelligence. Again, you, you should remember that the 101st Airborne Division didn't, it wasn't supposed to go to Mosul. We weren't supposed to go to Northern Iraq. We were supposed to end around Baghdad, and we desperately wanted to be on the center of our footprint to be Baghdad International Airport because we had 254 helicopters, and we want hard stand. We love hard stand. So here we're for on 40, 36 hours notice, we're told, get up there. The place is in flames, literally. 17 uh, citizens have been killed in a demonstration the day before. Um, and so we launched, I think, the longest air assault in history. We literally had to refuel en route to it. Uh, get on the ground, blanket the place, uh, and we've got it under control. And it's actually going great. Uh, we got this interim, put together this provincial council, but we're desperate for money. Uh, and so I had intelligence that uh, one of the banks had actually managed to save money, so we found the bank president. These are all nationally owned banks, of course. Nothing is free market, uh, was free market in those days. We brought him in, sat him down, and I said, um, this is sort of hopeful. I said, I understand you saved the money of your bank. He looked around furtively and he said, yes, I did. I said, whoa, you know, I didn't, I, I knew that, of course. Um, I said, and I understand there's enough to pay all the government workers in Nainua province, which is about 90% of the population, everything but the mom and pop soda stores. Uh, and he said, yeah, I do. I said, um, well, let's do it. He said, oh, I don't have the authority. Who has the authority? Well, the Minister of Finance. Uh, I said, I hate to break it to you, but you know, we did the fight to Baghdad, and I was just in Baghdad, it's where we we're supposed to stay. There is no Minister of Finance. In fact, there's not even a Ministry of Finance anymore. You're he's, looking at him. And he said, he said, yeah, you know, too bad. And then he looked and he said, but you have the authority. I said, you're right, I do. Under the Geneva Convention, an occupying force commander is the executive, legislative, and judicial all in one. I mean, I'm the sheikh of the strongest tribe in northern Iraq. So he's right. He said, make it in order. Um, we like orders here in, in, in you know, uh, Iraq. So I took out a pair of, you know, piece of generic, that card two-star stationery. I wrote out, you know, 
you're president of the Rafi Dane Bank, you're hereby ordered to pay the government's workers of Nainua Province. He looked at it, said, oh, oh, he said, you know, no stamp. So I, <laughs> you know, welcome to Iraq. I'll give we, you, I'll give we, you a receipt. We literally though. went out into the souk the next day. My aide designed the gaudiest stamp you've ever seen. It has stars all over the place. And, you know, we're stamping everything. Everybody would come to us, General, I need one of your things with a stamp. You know, it's sort of a... Anyway, so, so we set this up. And then what happened is I, I taught economics uh, at, at West Point. Um, and so all of a sudden I woke up in the middle of the night. We're about to dump a lot of money uh, on a closed economy because there were no goods coming in. Uh, the, the Turkish border was really blocked up. And so I went to our, and now I have a governor. I have a partner, which we desperately needed because we knew nothing about Nainua province. We didn't even have maps of it until the night before we were, we were launching. Um, and I said, Governor, um, how do we get more goods into the marketplace? Uh, he said, well, have you considered reopening the border with Syria? I didn't even know we'd close the border with Syria. We hadn't, actually. Somebody else had to try to prevent Saddam Hussein from getting away or something. So, you know, we do some research. It's a huge border. So I had my lawyers that night go into the UN Security Council resolutions on trade with Iraq. We do a set of promulgating instructions literally overnight. Um, if there's lawyers in the room, not everybody hates you. I love lawyers. Um, I, I, I could not get enough lawyers. I was fortunate to command both the division and the installation. So I brought the entire installation law legal office as well as the division legal office, and they were really useful. So they cranked out a set of promulgating instructions, sent them out on a helicopter to the colonel that was uh, the brigade that had the responsibility for with the border. Uh, and lo and behold, I said, you know, two days from now, we're coming out to reopen the border. Governor and I set it all up. They set it up. They got word across the border that we're going to reopen it. There is a line of trucks that's several miles long uh, that's going to provide the goods into the marketplace of, of Mosul City. Again, a city of about two million people with all of the different ethnic and sectarian groups. All the ethnic fault lines of the Middle East run through Nainua province. So the governor and I go out there. We cut the ribbon. We go with a big goat grab, as they call it, a thousand people all chowing down and uh, get back on the helicopters. And of course, I had a bunch of Apache attack helicopters to make sure they knew who was out there. You know, again, the sheikh of the strongest tribe in northern Iraq. I also, though, made the mistake of having a Washington Post reporter on board, uh, and he's pretty, pretty impressed by this. Uh, it was pretty extraordinary. I mean, this yeah. is just, you've just sort of restored life to all of Nainua province with this. Everybody depended on that border crossing. So as we're coming out of there, he said, General, this is incredible. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. What does it feel like uh, to do something like this? And I said, well, you know, sort of like being the cross between the Pope and the President. <laughs> and you can imagine how that played back you, in the Beltway. You, you know what was on the front page of the Washington Post <laughs> above the fold the next morning? And it was, you know, Major General David Petraeus in northern Iraq, col colon, a cross between Pope and President. So <laughs> that, was, that was the start of my, my you, challenges with the uh, Pentagon you, on. As you look back at all those things that you had, the legal, the finance, the economy, health and welfare, all these things, that, you know, in past days you wouldn't really think of a military leader having to have that capacity. But now in this, you know, these types well, in those kinds of wars, in irregular warfare, and again, especially if you don't get the help from the international organizations that we had hoped to have. You know, the problem in Iraq was that it, things were actually going very well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Coalition Provisional Authority showed up, um, and they immediately fired the Iraqi army, and then without telling them what their future was. And then they, they fired the Ba'ath Party down to a very low level. So, for example, we lost 120 tenured professors. By the way, they were all educated in the West. I mean, these were exactly what we wanted. They were secular. They drank, for goodness sake. I mean, what more could you want uh, in, in, in a Muslim country? I mean, this is... So here they all go. Now, I was able to get special dispensation. I caught Ambassador Bremer on a really hot day with the doors open on the helicopter. He's nodding off. And I said, could I get exception to policy and I could try out this little reconciliation idea? I mean, we reconciled with 15,000 Iraqis. So they're back in the fold. We got it. So this thing was going well. Unfortunately, then the UN mission in Baghdad was blown up by a suicide bomber. And Sergio Demello, one of the greatest international uh, diplomats of all time was killed 
and all of these organizations, we'd actually lured some of them to Mosul because the situation was much better, but then by and large they left. So we, okay, fine, we do it ourselves, and that's what we all did. Um, and, and then that worked. Um, and now there were challenges, there were ups and downs, and eventually we had to do the surge, but the surge basically did what we'd done in Mosul, but on a grander scale, uh, and it drove violence down by nearly 90%. That is not a trivial achievement, and General, those that were part of that were, should that be you very had, proud of The skills of that you had to bring to bear on that, those are basic leadership skills. Anyone in your family or in your history that kind of instilled or inspired that leadership? Sure, yeah. I mean, it started with a Dutch-American ship's captain who had all the great qualities of the Dutch, you know, stubborn, um, you know, my mother, I think, what was the, you know, wooden head, wooden shoes. I mean, again, uh, bl <laughs> blunt to a fault. Um, but, you know, the, the bottom line ship's captains, and, you know, we got a number of maritime folks in here. Um, he, he didn't brook much, you know, if I came home and say, yeah, Dad, you know, I didn't quite, uh, he'd look at me really and just say, results, boy. Results. results. And there's something to that. You know, life is not little kid's soccer. You don't get a t-shirt or a trophy just for showing up in the real world. It's a competitive endeavor. And he instilled that. Um, and, and, it, and it takes real commitment to do stuff. And, and again, like I know in this room we have a lot of entrepreneurs, we have a lot of people that have built businesses. I'm a, I, you know, I've spent 10 years now in one of the world's greatest investment firms, KKR. By the way, everybody should be a partner in KKR once in his life. <laughs> It's been unbelievable. And you know, we manage over half a trillion dollars now. Um, and uh, it gives you enormous respect for people who have built businesses, because that's what we're always looking to invest in and to help them grow and everything else. By the way, those individuals, the, the founders, the CEOs and so forth, they do the, perform these four tasks brilliantly. Um, so does Netflix, by the way. I love Reed Hastings as a, you know, as a great strategic leader. You know, think about Netflix. First big idea is we're going to put movies in the hands of customers without brick and mortar. We're going to undercut Blockbuster. Of course, they basically put them out of business except for Big, big Bend, Oregon, which is famously contrary and it won't let its Blockbuster die. It now it's become a tourist attraction for all the nostalgic people that want to rent movies and brick and mortar. Anyway, so that's the first big idea. Second big idea is um, broadband speeds are fast enough so people can download movies now. So they, they work that through. And again, all these other steps as well, of course. Third big idea is we're going to produce our own content. $100 million on House of Cards alone. You know, that's a real breakout moment for them. And then the fourth big idea is we're going to make major movies. We're going to buy a couple of major motion picture studios. They bought two of them, I think, not just one. And of course, one of the years, a few years ago, had more Academy Award nominations than any other company in the world. Now, I had issues, and I mentioned this to him, with the movie that had Brad Pitt playing my great buddy and combat comrade of at least five or six years, General Stan McChrystal. You know, Brad Pitt was very wooden in this movie. Stan was naughty. You know, he sort of marched around like a little toy soldier and all this stuff. And besides, I just couldn't get over the fact that Brad Pitt didn't play me. <laughs> So, General, now that you're working, now that you're working finance, is it pretty obvious to you the inherent leadership skills that cross over between? Oh, sure, yeah, government, yeah. civilian, military. Yeah. Sure. And, yeah. And, and do you yeah think but there are the, differences, obviously. The context is a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, in uniform, if you really have to, you shouldn't do it too often, mm -hmm. but you can resort to the, you know, now, oh, right. now hear this. Actually, yeah. the Navy does that a lot more than the Army. The Army is much more about persuasion. <laughs> Um, I mean, the Army practices is very, you know, kinder, gentler. Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but no, I, you know, so, and, and of course, you know, an awful lot of civilian organizations are much more matrixed. I mean, we're very, very matrixed. We work across the firm. Uh, but, you know, to manage, again, over half a trillion dollars with less than 2,500 people is no trivial task. Do you think there's more respect between the two, civilian? and the military now, because of the tasks that are assigned now in both sectors, require some real fundamental leadership ability. Well, I think there has been a massive awakening, literally over the last 
10 to 15 years in business about how attractive veterans are. And, and the numbers don't lie, uh, especially after look at active, active duty veterans, if I could, because the Guard and Reserves, there's some anomalies about their, their, the challenges that they have. They often want to go back to the same community or not as mobile and so forth. But active duty veterans, when I joined KKR, in fact, uh, over 10 years ago, the unemployment rate for active duty veterans was a good bit higher than the average unemployment rate for the rest of uh, the population. It is now way below it, despite counting those who are using the GI Bill to get an education actually as unemployed, which is probably something they shouldn't do. Uh, you know, my wife was an assistant director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that, uh, and was in charge of the Office of Service Member Affairs, looking out for those in uniform veterans and their families who were being targeted by ripoffs and got hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars back for them. But business has truly, I think, transformed in its recognition of how valuable the skills, the qualities, the experience, the attributes, uh, especially leadership, at a very young age. Um, you know, our son, who was a rifle platoon leader, second lieutenant in combat when I was the commander in Afghanistan, um, you know, he's got 43 guys in, under his leadership there, um, again, at the age of 21 or 22. That's a real, and, and of course, in combat. And, you know, there's no greater responsibility nor greater privilege than leading America's sons and daughters in combat. Now, General, I've been hearing, you know, the prototype for leadership in these difficult times, a lot of people believe is Vladimir Zelensky. And I think you've spent some time with him. Um, here's a guy who had no military experience, no diplomatic experience, was a comedian. Oh, and, yeah, but an actor. And an actor, an actor. And, and now he's he, got the part of a lifetime. We're talking about Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, obviously, of Ukraine. But the truth is, you know, actually his first two and a third years there were not that distinguished. And all of a sudden, Russia invades, and he is positively Churchillian. He's gotten the big ideas right repeatedly. His communication skills have been extraordinary. He's overseen the implementation of this brilliantly as well. And they've determined repeatedly how they need to refine the big ideas and do it again and again. And so I was just out there for four days last week uh, and did meet with him. Very impressive, as you might imagine. And it was very heartened to hear that not only, I didn't actually want to talk about the military stuff with him, of all things. Um, that I'm, I'm really confident. I'll be happy to explain that I think that they're going to do vastly better in this offensive than most analysts uh, recognize really and, and I'll lay out why but I actually asked him what are you doing to win the peace you have this moment of extraordinary national unity and I've been going to Ukraine since it was actually still a, a, a republic in the Soviet Union it was the first time I was the aide of the chief of staff of the army the first chief to visit the Soviet Union since George C. Marshall went to Yalta so this is quite a historic visit uh, and then many times since then, including a couple of times, again, as a partner at KKR, where we were looking at various opportunities, we always just shrunk from those, stepped back because of the lack of adequate rule of law. Uh, oligarchs or, and companies dominate an entire sector, monopolistic powers, uh, government bureaucracy, lack of transparency and integrity, corruption, all of this. It's really, it's, it's a, it was a very challenging landscape. And so I laid that out, said, you know, what are you going to do to make this, a, you, we should be competing for this destination instead of shrinking from it, especially because you're going to need that given all the damage. There will be a Marshall-like reconstruction plan, but they really need the private sector. So having and, been there just in the past week, is the yeah. new offensive underway? Well, it depends how you define an offensive. What I, what I, the best way to answer that is to say that the main effort has not yet launched. We'll know it when this main effort goes. They are going to shatter the Russian lines. And let me explain why that is. Uh, so what we've seen so far is what the military would call shaping operations, reconnaissance and force, uh, deception, uh, all of this, uh, distraction even. Um, in fact, while we were there, they were running these operations into Russia, uh, into Belgorod up on the eastern side there. In fact, one of the guys, we literally met with him over Zoom. He steps into his armored vehicle and coming, because he'd really want to, he's one of their intel chiefs, and uh, he wanted to meet with me. Uh, and he said, sorry, I really wanted to be there, but we, I got, I got this little thing going on over here. You know, I got to need to oversee it. 
uh, don't want these guys getting trapped in Russia. Um, so here's the situation. The Russian forces have been in combat in many cases for 12 to 14, 15 months. Um, they had not learned what we learned the hard way in Vietnam, that, that you don't do individual replacement, you do unit replacement, which is what we did do in Iraq and Afghanistan and worked well. So when they take losses, these units have often been rendered combat ineffective. And normally you should pull them off the line, you should, in a safe place, replace the, the personnel they've lost, the equipment they've lost, and retrain them for 30 days or so, so that you rebuild the cohesion and the, the, the trust and you know, that sense of responsibility for each other, the brotherhood of the close fight, as they say, and so forth. They don't do that. They stay in the line, by and large, and they just add people back in. And that does not produce, again, a, a well-trained, cohesive, well-disciplined, well-equipped organization. Uh, the leadership is quite abusive. They're famously abusive. The culture in these organizations is actually of committing war crimes rather than preventing them adhering to the Geneva Convention. And they have very limited reserves in, behind their lines. They're basically along these lines, in many cases, forward of their defensive positions, which means that they'll have to withdraw under contact with the enemy, which is the toughest possible maneuver. And here come the Ukrainians. They have units that they have been building. There are six armored brigades alone, and then a number of other brigades. They, they will have Western tanks, Western infantry fighting vehicles, Western artillery, uh, all kinds of other Western systems, much better command and control systems. And they've been training at our training centers in Germany, in Eastern Poland, in the UK, elsewhere. And they have experienced leaders. Some of the troops, to be sure, are new. Uh, but they're going to go at this. They're going to achieve combined arms effects for the first time in this war. And that's where you have armor that's protected by infantry to keep the anti-tank guided missiles off them, artillery and mortars that are keeping the enemy's head down and suppressing their actions, electronic warfare jamming this, the, their own high frequency, single channel, unencrypted the Russians, which is the, horrible. We are on FM encrypted frequency hopping, very hard to jam. Um, air defense to make sure their close air support can't come to bear, which it's not really by and large. Anyway, engineers with enormous vehicles to do the breaching. This is the one thing that will take time. They have to get through their own minefields, which they're breaching every night under the cover of darkness and they've got to get through the Russian minefields and then over their trenches. They'll do that. And when they do, they're going to crack this brittle Russian force, and then it's going to start moving. It's going to turn dynamic. Um, and if they can capitalize on this in a way they did not last year in the Eastern, remember in Kharkiv, they made a huge advance, but then they culminated. That's what happens after nine, 72 or 96 hours. This happened in the fight to Baghdad. I remember it personally. Uh, I reached a point personally where if I actually sat down, I immediately fell asleep. I mean, this is why God created Command Sergeant's Major, because he guided me off and he said, you know, sir, this is actually why there are one-star generals for when the two-star needs to go take a nap. And we have a little pup tent over here. But so this time, though, they have follow-on forces. So let's say you crack it with two brigades online or even just one. I mean, these are large formations, 3,000, 3,500 troops. Uh, then when they culminate and they take losses and vehicles and personnel, this next one does a forward passage lines and keeps going. And they have logistics right up behind them this time with ammunition, food, fuel, water, medical support, and so forth. So I think this is going to be, again, much more successful. What's the impact of the dam being blown up recently? <clears throat> it's negligible, really. I mean, it, it's... It who, does it, who does it benefit? Uh, it doesn't benefit either side. I think it probably hurts the Russians more than the Ukrainians because the Russians are more affected. The areas that they control, there are 80 towns and villages that have to be evacuated. There are people actually trapped in buildings that they can't get out. Uh, again, another example of Russian ineptitude. It's not conclusive, but it seems that the Russians uh, mine the interior of this and then it either by mistake or uh, consciously blew it up. But it creates problems for them for Crimea because this reservoir actually feeds a canal that actually takes water down to Crimea. Now, they've done without it before. They didn't have it from 2014 to 2022 uh, and managed to muddle through. But that's a big blow to them. Uh, it reduces the hydroelectric uh, power generation, which, again, mostly was for the 
the Russian controlled areas. But, but the river runs along like this, the offense is going to go like this, and it's flooding an area here. So I, I don't think it has a huge impact. And, and if anything, it's more disruptive for the Russians than for the Ukrainians. One of the things that Putin seems to be betting on is how long the Western support will last. He's hoping that he might get an election yes. here. Yep. yep. And sure. And, and 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 of course, we've been giving them enormous amounts of materials. Huge whatever. quantities. And again, thirty-eight billion dollars. Again, by the way, I am completely non-political, not just bipartisan. I don't even register to vote, much less vote. Um, I, and I don't support or contribute to candidates, and I advise members of either party that are, that are serious uh, members. Um, so when I offer this, uh, I actually think the Biden administration has done a very impressive job in, in leading the entire world, not just NATO, but the entire Western world in responding. $38 billion of arms, ammunition, and assistance. Yes, there's some decisions I'd like to have seen taken much earlier than they were, the tank decision, the F-16 or Western aircraft decision, now the Army Tactical Missile System, uh, dual purpose improved conventional munitions. There's a handful of these that have we've dragged our feet, but you can't argue with $38 billion. Uh, it's just extraordinary what we have done. Some and again, say keeping it's, the it's, alliance together. But you're right. Putin still thinks that the Russians will be able to outsuffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the Americans. And we have to help Ukraine prove him wrong and help Europe prove him wrong. Do you think the West and NATO are in it all the way? Is Crimea a bridge too far for the support? I think it's, uh, that is something that is heavily discussed very quietly behind closed doors. Um, and a lot depends on this offensive. This can change the entire dynamic. And keep in mind that in the beginning, you know, we, uh, do we really want to give them this? And then what would happen is the British give it to them. So they give a few hundred of something, anti-tank guided missiles. You know, so we watch, nothing happens, so we plow in 7,000. Um, they've given, by the way, Storm Shadow, this longer range precision munition, which is really helping them. Uh, and again, we should follow on with, with ATACMS. Um, do you think it's possible for either side to win militarily? I actually it, think it may be. Really? Again, I mean, let's not, see. not just a stalemate. It's not going to happen this summer, but let's see how far they get. If they get to the territorial demarcation of Crimea, and keep in mind there's a body of water there for the most part. There's a little land bridge. Uh, this is a totally different military problem. You've got mountains. You have, you'd have to go amphibious. Um, and they have, got, they have built some extraordinary forces but they don't quite yet rival the U.S. Marine Corps when it comes to launching amphibious invasions. So, um, but you can then put Crimea in play. You can, you can put their air bases, their logistical sites, the naval headquarters, the naval bases, all at risk, especially if we provide the Army tactical missile system. And you could create a situation where they actually have to withdraw. This is what happened. Remember they had forces west of the Dnipro River in an area called Kherson, and they basically made the bridges untrafficable. They didn't completely take them down uh, because they really can't. It's hard to take a bridge down, but you can make it untrafficable. And then they just started methodically taking out the headquarters with one of the previous uh, precision munitions that we provided. That took them out to about 150 kilometers. ATACMS would take them to 300. Uh, and they just started pinpointing all this stuff, taking out. And the Russians finally realized, you know what? We can't support these people over here, and we're going to lose them. Sooner or later, they're going to surround them, so they withdrew them. You could force that, I think, actually, with Ukraine. And the way, again, you, you, you take out all these different sites, eventually you've got to take down the Kerch Strait Bridge. They took down part of it before, and then you're going to have to start taking down the, uh, the ferries that have always traditionally su su supplied it. But having met with Zelensky, is there any question in your mind that he's fighting all out to win the knockout punch and not just negotiating for position in, in, a, in a settlement? Well, he cannot even hint that he is, is willing to accept anything less than Ukraine whole and free. Keep in mind that these people are fighting their war of independence. And again, we need to do everything we can to help them win it. This is a, as right versus wrong as it can possibly get. Um, but when dynamics change, it's, it's conceivable that there should be and could be a negotiated resolution. Keep in mind that for Ukraine, they need to stop the bleeding. You know, every night that we were there, 
we were getting, you know, is it wasn't quite the blitz, uh, I mean, the way BBC made it sound, but there were air raid sirens every single night. And yes, they're knocking down every missile and just about every drone, uh, but, you know, people still get killed by the debris that fell. Three of them were killed in one single night alone. By the way, I mean, it was really interesting because I had a little delegation with me of people, including, again, Lord Roberts of Belgravia, and, you know, the first siren goes off. Man, he's scrambling, and I said, you know, I, I lived through Baghdad. I think I have a sense of this stuff, and I think if we just stay indoors, you know, um, we're going to be okay here. Maybe draw the blinds so there's no fl flying glass if somehow something miraculously happened. Um, so again, but these people have endured this. They endured Bucha. We went to Bucha. The, the, the atrocities committed <coughs> at Bucha are just horrific, and they have documented all of it. They're pursuing, uh, again, cases. They want accountability, not just reparations. Um, so again, this is a country that 95% or so almost support their president and support Ukraine whole and free. And that includes the liberation of Crimea. So don't ever say no that there could be some kind of negotiated resolution, but wait to see what this offensive does and how that changes the dynamic. Keep in mind, this isn't just about the battlefield losses for Putin. And keep in mind as well, they lost more in a single battle uh, boot, uh, that, that they took this one city uh, in the winter, barely, and now they're in the process of losing it. Um, they lost 20,000 soldiers in that one fight in their failed winter offensive. A continue, continuation of failure. You know, they failed, they lost the Battle of Kiev, they lost the Battle of Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, Kherson, and Kharkiv province. They lost the, they did not achieve control of Donetsk and Luhansk, which was the objectives. Yes, they did get, uh, again, this one city. But 20,000 losses uh, in a few months over a meaningless uh, city they destroyed, basically, in taking it, that's 5,000 more than they lost in nearly a decade in Afghanistan, which was unsustainable. And what we have to convey to Putin is that this war is unsustainable on the battlefield and also, by the way, on the home front, and we need to tighten down further the personal, financial, and economic sanctions and export controls. You say this is their revolutionary war. Is this our proxy war, given the losses that the Russians have taken there and equipment, people? Sure, in many respects it is. Keep in mind that there were two major security concerns for the United States, you know, the biggest far and away uh, is China and the relationship between the U.S. and the West and China. Obviously, that's the focus. Um, but Russia was the other. Uh, and this dramatically reduces the threat that Russia will pose when this is all eventually resolved. Uh, obviously, there's still North Korea. Yes, there's Islamist extremists. Yes, there's insurgencies that we've now figured out because of the advent of drones and a lot of other systems that we can fight these by advising, assisting, and enabling host nation forces rather than having to do it all for ourselves, which is quite a dramatic revolution. NATO meets again in July. Are these dynamics going to change what's discussed there? Is this going to accelerate uh, bringing Ukraine into NATO? Well, what, we, what needs to happen at Vilnius on 11 July, this is the NATO summit, um, and President Zelensky was quite forceful on this, and I very strongly agree with him. There has to be something more ironclad than just sort of a vague uh, comment about potential NATO membership down the road. There probably should be an ironclad commitment to continue to support Ukraine, even as it is uh, given some path to NATO once, obviously, the, quote, territorial dispute is, is resolved. It's interesting that the country that is, has most qualms about the path to NATO is Germany, which has been a good supporter of Ukraine. They just pledged another $3 billion of arms, ammunition, and assistance but seem to have forgotten that when they were allowed to join NATO, there, there was a small territorial uh, dispute between West and East Germany. Um, but the, you know, the ironies of life, I mean, there's some incredible ironies, by the way, in this situation. Uh, the foremost is that Putin set out to make Russia great again, and what he's really done is make NATO great again. I mean, he's the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War. And then he's done more for Ukrainian nationalism than any Ukrainian nationalist political figure. Keep Jeff in mind, there were still sympathies for Russia in places like Kharkiv, Russian-speaking, ethnic Russians. He's, that's gone. You know, there's no sympathy. 
for Putin General, virtually you, anywhere in Ukraine. Have you spent the last 10 years on the financial side of the equation? Are you surprised that the sanctions, the economic sanctions, weren't more effective than they seem not to have been? Not entirely. I mean, you have to understand their economy. Uh, you have to understand the sources of their revenue. You have to understand that there are people in the world that will buy Russian oil at a discount, certainly. I mean, we're a bit disappointed to see India be, be among those. Uh, but, you know, those are the realities of life. Could we do more? Could yeah, we? we? We can, and we should, and we are. Actually. I mean, can we put pressure on India not to buy Russian no, oil? No, look, I mean, we can't even... There's all kinds of car vats here. Keep, I mean, again, keep in mind that Ukraine is still allowing Russian gas to transit its, its soil. Why? Because they make money on it. I mean, in the middle of war, mm -hmm. uh, they are facilitating that because they get huge revenue from it, and they think that they may still be getting some natural gas from it. So there's all these carve-outs. You know, Hungary wouldn't agree to this until they got a carve-out. So again, there are realities in life. Um, and, and I th still, look, I think one of, the, one of the big takeaways about the world is that certainly we should always have our ideals. We should always have the values that we cherish and would like to see flourish elsewhere. But you, know, you have to deal with the world the way that it is, not the way that you would like it to be. Um, and I think occasionally administrations get a bit out on the idealistic side and then eventually have to come back to the realistic side. You still have to, de you have to deal with Saudi Arabia. And by the way, of course, to be fair, uh, Tony Blinken is out there right now. Um, so, um, but when you hear these criticisms that we haven't given the weapons fast enough, the same way with sanctions, is there anything left on the table? Oh yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah, there is. And there's a brilliant guy in the Treasury Department, Wally Adeyemo, Rhodes Scholar, just off the charts, uh, brilliant guy who is spearheading this. But again, you've got to bring on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, again, we have been slow with some decisions, but again, I think what the U.S administration and Congress, because of course this has required very strong support in Congress, which is still strong, uh, even in the party that has elements in the House that are, are, are critical of this. Uh, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham, who was just over there, he was one of the three amigos. You know, there were only about three senators that really firmly supported the, the surge, uh, and it was McCain, Lieberman, and Graham, we called them the three amigos. They spent every 4th of July with us. I, you know, I spent eight of my final 11 Fourth of July downrange, and I think they were there for six of them or something like that. They're really extraordinary. So that support's still there. Uh, yes, there are concerns. Yes, hearing Speaker McCarthy the other day, you know, voice some of those concerns, that's uh, not helpful. Again, we're trying to convince Putin that this is unsustainable, um, and you don't do that. We made the mistake as well when we announced the buildup in Afghanistan and in the same speech announced the drawdown date. You know, that's not how you persuade the enemy that you ha are, have greater will than they do. Mm -hmm. You know, in the surge in Iraq, I refused to tell Congress that we were gonna draw down. Um, I said it was conditions, it wasn't. I had, we had to draw down. There were no more army forces. You know, we got five and two thirds brigades. That's what I asked for because that's all there was. I knew where every unit in the, in the Army and the Marines, there were two Marine battalions, that's the two-thirds. Then we got the Mew as well. You know, that was floating offshore. I said, we need that onshore. So this um, is the last shot on the surge. If, if, if the surge if, oh, was if that had failed, we were in deep trouble. But, but honestly, I actually believed that it was going to succeed. My concern was that it might not succeed quickly enough. Look, you know, a lot of us had spent a long time there. I've been on the ground for two and a half years at that point already by the time I well, go back you, as a four star. Then we did the counterinsurgency field manual. We distilled this. We'd, we'd overhauled the, all the preparation of our forces, leaders, units, staffs, equipment, organizations. Um, and we really, I believe that we were going to do that. I have, had to go back at six months though and I had to report some progress. And that was getting a bit dicey when it, that four and a half month mark uh, only then did it start to turn. But by, that, by the time, again, I showed up, I think violence was down by 40 or 45 You once questioned yourself uh, with Rick Atkinson up in Mosul saying, how does this all end? I mean, it, and, and what no, do you- No, this is during the fight to Baghdad. Yeah. Let me explain it to put this in context. You know, we'd been given a set of assumptions about what was going to unfold in Iraq, and I was literally watching these assumptions be invalidated one by one. Uh, and, and I knew Rick very well from before. Again, I occasionally forgot that everything was on the record with him. 
Uh, and that's when I turned to him and I said, Rick, you know, tell me how this ends. And with a question mark, and of course I heard that repeatedly, including from Hillary Clinton during my confirmation hearing. And I actually laid out, here's how it's going to end. Uh, and by the way, it, it did. And we drove violence down again by nearly 90%. It was sustained for three and a half years until we pulled out our final combat troops and the prime minister within 24 or 36 hours undid uh, with a couple of terrible decisions, uh, tore the fabric of society apart. He went after the senior Sunni uh, uh, political figure, the vice president, within 24 hours of our departure. By the way, I showed up 48 hours later as the CIA director. The ambassador is not in town. He's gone on Christmas vacation. Um, and the charge is out at the airport there to meet me. And I thought, gee, you didn't need to come out here. I got the station chief. He said, no, all hell's broken loose. So instead of going to the station and, you know, talking to them about the holiday season um, and having a beer, because the CIA doesn't have general order number one, of course, being a much more enlightened force. You remember general order number one is you don't drink in a you know, war zone. Um, so uh, instead, I spent the whole night shuttling between the prime minister and the Sunnis and, you know, the sh these other groups and back and forth. And we sort of got it. But then he did took a number, number of other actions. But no, that actually did work. It pulled a country out of a civil war, uh, gave them an entire new opportunity. I'm a bit optimistic about Iraq right now. I met with the new prime minister in Munich a few months back. Um, he courageously, publicly said that he wants the American forces to stay. That takes courage in a country where Iran is trying to to do to, the, to Iraq what they did to Lebanon, which is to get control of the parliament and also to have a powerful militia on the ground that responds to them, i.e. Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. So again, touch wood there. I Afghanistan, very different situation, vastly more difficult. I remember telling uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, he asked me, you know, Rumsfeld, the reward for, you know, a good deed was always a chance to do another good deed. So I remember I came home as a two-star and he sent me back within a month and a half to do an assessment of some stuff over there that hadn't gone well in 2004. I come back, I give him the recommendations. He said, these are terrific, change command, go back over and implement them. I said, you know, I'm commanding the 101st Airborne Division. I sort of like to see this through. I want to jump at the 60th anniversary of Normandy. I jumped at the 50th, you know, it's, no, so get back over. And then he comes over and sees me, then he extends that tour, so that one ends up being 15 and a half months. He comes over and he, and he says, um, hey, you know, this is actually going pretty well. Um, I'd like you to come home through Afghanistan. I said, Afghanistan? You know, that's not the direct route back to my family in Washington. So we went over there, and I remember I brought back a set of recommendations to him. The very first, you know, military uses were authorized, you know, under the First Amendment, freedom of expression, aided by PowerPoint, um, all, all general officers at least. And so I, the very first slide was titled, Afghanistan does not equal Iraq, and it laid out a compare and contrast in a variety of different uh, factors. And, it's, and I said, Afghanistan is going to be the longest of the long wars um, because of this, even though the violence level at that time was vastly less. I mean, we were driving around in thin-skinned vehicles ourselves. But all the different factors, sanctuaries in Pakistan, the worst of all of those, they would never deal with the Taliban or the Haqqani network or the others that had, they could scamper back across the border. Um, you know, no money at all. Iraq had $100 billion in oil revenue, if you, if you could get the electricity working again, obviously, which we did during the surge. Massive corruption, you know, illiteracy, uh, real terrain challenge, no infrastructure. But having gone through both of those, General, do you think you get to the point in these counterinsurgencies and asymmetrical warfare and all this stuff, these wars are not winnable? I mean, the intended consequences, you know, all the tremendous effort that everyone put into Iraq and Afghanistan. When you look back at it now, militarily we were successful, but at the end of the day, were we successful? Uh, I would contend that in Iraq we actually did achieve sufficient success, and tragically it was undone by the Prime Minister. Um, and that also allowed, that took the security forces focus off the remnants of what we knew as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, by then was the Islamic State, allowed them to reconstitute. That created a whole new problem. We had to go back in But wasn't it the same in them. Afghanistan, that we lost well, the government me, there? Well, let me finish on Iraq. Um, I, I don't think Iraq is, you know, again, it, it, they're never going to be uh, 
Switzerland in 20 years or less. Look, Korea wasn't Switzerland in 20 years. Remember the problems of corruption and the military strongmen and dictate, I mean, all this stuff. You have to stick with it. Um, Afghanistan, I freely conceded that this is not winnable in the way that we'd like to win it, but it is, it is adequate. Um, it, is it, it is sustainable. Uh, it, again, it's frustrating, it's maddening, our partners are far from perfect, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But my argument was that, you know, we had 3,500 troops on the ground, a lot of drones, Yes, the security situation had eroded, but it was sort of sustainable. I mean, isn't that vastly better for the majority of the Afghan people? Not all, some of the rural areas, it's, a, it's arguable. Vastly better than what is going to happen if we pull out, which is the Taliban are gonna take the country again, and they're gonna take it back to an eighth or ninth century interpretation of Islam, which is exactly what has happened. I mean, I. So again, I was kind to the administration on Ukraine. I am not on Afghanistan. I did, I do not, or the previous administration that did the worst diplomatic agreement in our history, where we, we, we didn't even allow the elected government that we were supporting uh, a seat at the table, uh, and then basically gave the Taliban what they wanted without getting anything for and, it. And the exit date. And we pushed the, our own, uh, partners to release 5,500 Taliban is to get the Taliban to agree to accept our departure. Uh, again, and, and you know, there's this argument that, but we didn't, take, <coughs> we didn't take any casualties because of that. It's not so. We didn't take any casualties because we were on the front lines anymore. We had shifted to what I felt was a sustainable uh, strategy, which could have been sustained, uh, which was, again, advise, assist, enable, train, and equip, not fight, with the exception of periodic special operations by special mission units. Um, and again, my argument was that that was much better. And I also predicted that, you know, if you pull out, then we're gonna pull all these maintenance workers that have to maintain our very sophisticated helicopters that we forced on them. I refused when I was the commander to, to take the Blackhawks. I said, no, not yet. Let's keep the Soviet. They know how to use them. They can repair them. They're much more rugged. Uh, and then we put in these very, very capable uh, Black Hawk uh, assault helicopters and then uh, various uh, fixed wing uh, aircraft, C-130s and so forth, they're just not maintainable by the Afghans. And so there were 17,000 contractors and the real Achilles heel was withdrawing the contractors because you had a defensive strategy that was the only strategy possible, which is you have forces out all around the country protecting various critical uh, population centers and infrastructure and then you have a very good uh, strategic reserve, operational reserve, 35,000 Afghan commandos, very well trained, equipped. Now, by the way, the idea that the Afghans wouldn't fight is just inaccurate. That's just not true. 26 times uh, as many Afghans died as did uh, American soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines. Uh, but but I, I, again, said this on Fox, I think six or eight weeks prior to the collapse, that I fear that once they realize no one's coming to the rescue because the, the helicopter readiness is eroding already, um, you know, you don't fight if nobody's coming to the rescue. General, in the last few minutes we have here, uh, let's shift uh, geography a little bit. This new world order, a lot of drama sure. this week in the uh, Taiwan Straits. Mm -hmm. uh, had Ukraine not emerged like it did, would all of our focus be there rather than uh, in, in Eastern Europe? Look, that is still the main effort for, the, for our country and really for the, the Western world. Um, the single biggest development of the last 10 years, well, I, and, you know, what I do at KKR, I don't structure deals, I should, you know, acknowledge here. I do geopolitical risk and figure out how we can mitigate it. We integrate the macroeconomic analysis, the environmental social governance issues analysis, and then, again, identify risks to the success of an investment. We figure out how to mitigate them or we say, we shouldn't do this deal, which I've actually I've vetoed a number of deals uh, over the years. And then you help the companies once you've made the investments. That's our, our focus. The single biggest development during that 10-year period has been the uh, evolution of geopolitics uh, from a world of benign globalization in which barriers to trade, investment, capital flows were all being gradually reduced, going down, and global trade was going up at about a 45 degree angle. 
Uh, and now we're in an era of renewed great power rivalries in which the barriers are all going up again uh, and in which globalization has become slobalization. It's still gradually increasing, but at a relatively low rate. And a lot of that is more regionalization, actually, than it is true globalization. This is a profound change. And the single biggest reason is, has been the continued rise of China, the more aggressive actions and assertive actions uh, by China, whether it's wolf warrior diplomacy, economic coercion, uh, again, what they're doing in the Taiwan Strait, uh, in the airspace uh, out there, um, again, killing Indian soldiers at the line of actual control in three different fights, dozens of them, uh, and, and on and on. And all of that uh, without, again, uh, shielding at all or hiding at all what their aspirations are. What would you say um, is the risk assessment for invading Taiwan? If you're in China or if, you're, if you have a financial stake in a semiconductor company in Taiwan, what do you think the risk assessment is there now? We don't think that we don't expect an invasion of, of Taiwan. Um, we think, number one, we have something to do. We have some agency here, and it's called deterrence. And deterrence rests on a potential adversary's assessment of two elements. One, your capabilities, and the other, your willingness to employ those capabilities. And we have to transform, above all, our military capabilities. By the way, it's also, there's other factors in there, too. There are trade, it's legal, it's diplomatic, it's... Uh, economic and so forth, but it really rests on the assessment of our, our military capabilities. And we have to transform our military, by and large, this is very overly simplistic, but from uh, a small number of very large platforms that are incredibly capable, uh, but hugely expensive, very heavily manned, and frankly quite vulnerable in a world in which we finally have operationalized the old NATO adage, which we didn't operationalize then, which was, if it can be seen, it can be hit. If it can be hit, it can be killed. You can see everything nowadays. In the Indo-Pacific, you can be seen, you can therefore be targeted, uh, and very likely you might be hit. We have to transform from that world to one of a vastly larger number of unmanned uh, ground, sea, subsea, air, space, and cyberspace uh, systems, uh, very, very capable still, uh, but many of these are either remotely piloted or actually increasingly going to be algorithmically piloted. Uh, and where the person in the loop, you know, hang on to your seat here, but the person in the loop is eventually going to be the person that designs the algorithm rather than some person who has his or her hands on the control. Um, We've got to make that transformation because that's what will enhance deterrence. Now, you also have to improve the resilience of our bases out there. We have a lot of people that have spent time deployed uh, in the bases out in the Indo-Pacific. And again, if it can be seen, it can be hit. Uh, and we have to improve the defenses of them. We've got to go deeper. We have to harden them and all the rest of this. And the Pacific Defense Initiative uh, is, is intended to do a lot of that, and it got a, the best funding this year that it has ever gotten. I think it's 10, 10 or more billion dollars. Uh, and I talked to Admiral Aquilino, the uh, Pacific Command Commander, fairly regularly. So, again, because of that, because we are undertaking this transformation, and frankly because the President has four times seemed to slip up and say that, yes, we'll come to the rescue of Taiwan. And then, of course, Jake Sullivan goes out and says, oh, you know, but our policy of uh, strategic ambiguity is still in place, no change, or you still adhere to the, you know, the, this and this and this. Um, but that's significant, and that is, I believe, intended uh, to make sure that there's no question that we would take action. And then we have, you know, we're back in the Philippines, four bases there again, uh, thankfully with President Marcos at the helm. Japan is doubling its defense spending over the course of, the, of, of a decade, basically. New uh, national security strategy. So you're seeing this lattice work being stitched uh, around the first island chain and so forth, and then beyond. All of a sudden, we're paying attention to the islands, you know, the island hopping campaign, these islands that Marines sacrifice so much uh, to, to, to liberate from the Japanese. They're important again. But General, you know, as we were talking before about Iraq and Afghanistan, maybe even back to Vietnam, in this very interconnected world, uh, non-state actors, political insurgencies, and all this stuff, 
in a traditional sense, are wars winnable by the military? Sure, they are. Yeah. yeah. I no, mean, again, or, not, or, not or is, always. Or is the military more of a deterrence now to get to a negotiating well, it zone? It depends on what the context is. I mean, the Gulf War was quite winnable, and it was won. Mm -hmm. uh, Panama was won. Uh, Korea, you know, again, you at least stabilized the, the border where it was. Uh, Vietnam, obviously not. Um, Grenada was. Again, so it, it depends on the context, on the situation. And what we want to do, again, we don't want to have to Look, a war with China, I don't think you could say that any side is going to win something like that. It has to be avoided. It has to be deterred. You have to dissuade President Xi or his successor from even considering that. Do you seriously. take stock in anything that they say that maybe President Xi is somewhat humbled by the failures of Putin in There's Ukraine? a big debate about this, about what the effect on what lessons China is taking, what lessons the Politburo Standing Committee and President Xi himself, of course, noting that, you know, this is an unprecedented third term as party leader from which follows the presidency and the chairman of the military commission. But no, there's a bit of a debate going on about whether this has a chastening effect, a cost cautionary effect, or if they say, yeah, you know, we, we're not corrupt like the Russians, uh, we have professional forces, we're better equipped, um, uh, all of this, you could argue that. I, I tend to to think this is a more cautionary tale than not. And you know, the Chinese are very conscious that they have not been in combat since the late 1970s against Vietnam, and that actually didn't turn out all that well for them. You know, they, all of our adversaries, when they get to visit Washington, they all want to come out to the CIA, and I was happy to have them out there. And so we'd bring the Chinese generals in, and you know, somewhere along the line, I'd you know, say, well, you know, of course I, you know, humbly, falsely humbly, um, I'd say, well, of course, you know, I did have five combat commands as a general officer, but, but I know that all of you have had lots of, oh, well, maybe you haven't, actually, you know. Um, <laughs> look, you know, you have a lot of people in this room that have been in combat, and you don't know until you're in it um, how people will respond. You don't know how your forces are going to do. You, again, remember that great Mike Tyson quote, you know, everybody has a plan until he gets punched in the nose. Um, and uh, they are conscious of that. They haven't really done anything remotely like what it is they would have to do. I don't need to tell folks in this room how an amphibious assault across a hundred mile expanse of open ocean can go seriously wrong. Are you concerned at all about any intelligence threats from China? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So uh, from your CIA huge. days, do you think the, the threats Very are much. So if you think, uh, are, are you worried about Huawei or TikTok? Are you, do you think it's that? We should, be, again, we should be worried about a whole variety of it. I mean, we, again, we know what has happened. Um, again, this has been exposed repeatedly, uh, thankfully, by some firms that are right out here, by the way. Um, it was Mandiant Corporation, as I recall, that exposed uh, a variety of Chinese spying activities. Uh, I think they were the ones that even uncovered uh, the, the, gov what, the organization that had all our security clearance records. Uh, that was the mother load, and they hacked that. Um, no, they have, they have a vacuum cleaner for data, because what they're trying to do is assemble a mass of data, this huge haystack of data from which they want to pull needles and identify these are the spies. I mean, it's publicly known that we lost nearly half of our human sources in China uh, at one point in time because of their very, very skillful counterintelligence work. We think, again, nothing in the, is in the past 20 certain. years? What's the time? Yeah. Past, uh, past uh, 15 years, let's past? say. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. No, I, and there was, I think there, we think there was a mistake in some communications and on the basis of one. Uh, find they then just sort of connected some other dots painstakingly over many years. So no, it's a, it's a, and it, it, you cannot imagine a more challenging environment in which to operate. Back when I was the director, before you had this incredible surveillance system that now is, I don't know how many of you have been in China in recent years, but you know, every telephone pole has a camera pointing in every cardinal direction, um, and, and on and on. And, and you know, they, they had a really, nifty little app that you had to put on your phone if you went in there during COVID. Uh, and you had to have it on all the time and you had to always have your phone with you and it had to be green uh, or you couldn't go into a building, get in a vehicle or anything like this. Well, you know, if you have your phone with you, they know exactly where you are uh, all the time. 
Given all these intractable problems, you spend a lot of time with young leaders forums. Uh, are you encouraged about this next generation of leaders coming Very up? Very much so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mentioned to some before we were coming in here that um, in addition, again, being a partner at KKR and chairing our Global Institute and doing some, you know, a couple of boards and strategic advisors and some of the companies, uh, my wife and I personally are invest, have invested over the last decade in 27 startups. And the reason we do that really is we just get excited about young leaders who have powerful big ideas, including our daughter-in-law, by the way, who's an Afghan veteran, Harvard, Afghan veteran, Rhodes Scholar on her second startup, uh, and has a grandchild too. So I mean, they're they're that's this a this is a pretty good couple, by the way. He so he was airborne and uh, special operations um, MIT to begin with, and then did a JD MBA at Harvard, and wants to go back to public service. Speak. He's with a big huge law firm, but he wants to be in the the Southern District of New York uh, as a prosecutor. Sovereign District of New York, as some of you may know. So one last question to AI, speaking of public service. Is General Petraeus running for political office? No, I've said this a thousand times. I could never persuade President Obama that I was not running for office. That was a source of some friction. It, um, AI agrees with you. As of June 7th, there is oh, no indication oh, that General okay. David Petraeus is running for political office. Thank goodness. Uh, but he has the name recognition and experience that would make him a formidable candidate. I like, I, I'm sort of getting you like fond of this you like, AI you like stuff it. here, yeah. <laughs> General Petraeus, 37 no. years. We thank you for your service no. uh, in all these different fields, the military, intelligence, now in the world of finance, and thank you for your insights. No, I thank you. Thanks, and I, I mean that. Um, look. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from Marines Memorial Association and Foundation. To learn more about the organization and our programs, please visit our website at marinesmemorial.org.